Welcome to Emmanuel Church Glenhaven Bible Talks. Our church loves to engage with God's written word, the Bible, as we gather week by week. If you missed a sermon or want to hear it again, we pray that your time here today will refresh and renew you as you follow Jesus. Today we continue our series of sermons in Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth called Power Made Perfect in Weakness. This week it was Compassion Sunday when we feature the work of Compassion Australia. For many years, Emmanuel Church has partnered with Compassion in their important work of releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. Our church has a particular connection with the Bohol area in the south of the Philippines and together we sponsor more than 50 children. In this talk, Hayden Smith challenges us from 2 Corinthians to think about generosity in the light of our partnership with Compassion. What does generosity look like? And what is the right motivation for Christian giving? But before we hear from Hayden, let's listen to the Bible. The passage is 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 15. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then, by the will of God, also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, See that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work, so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it, according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it's written, The one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, here's Hayden. Father, we thank you that you do speak to us by your word, by your Holy Spirit. Help us to understand not so much about money today, but about the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you'd be teaching us grace and the gift that it is to be those who are like Christ in being generous in heart. Amen. Uh, The other day, um, our two middle children, Talitha and Florence, were preparing for a day out. And at the same time, Evie, our eldest, and Sebastian, our youngest, they were planning to go out together as well. Now, Sebastian, at this point, confided in me that he didn't want to go, or specifically, he didn't want to go with Evie because, and I quote, she is a bully. (laughs) I asked him what he meant by this, and he said, she doesn't let me buy the things that I want to buy, 
and anything I suggest to buy, she says, is a waste of money. <laughs> now, she may well be right, but I explained to Sebastian that Evie, as the eldest, well, she had the card, and so she was responsible for making sure there was enough money for lunch and for the train and for emergency situations. But I said to him, look, how about this? Evie can look after the card, but I'm going to give you $5 in cash. I know, I know. And you can hold on to that, and you can spend it on anything you like. So he was quite heartened by this, and so they went on their adventure. They got the train up to Lura Lolly Shop, and Sebastian walked into the lolly shop, clutching his $5 note. The world was brimming with sugar and freedom. In a sense, I think Sebastian was tasting something of adulthood there. Because we clutch our little fortunes and we look out on a world that is filled with possibilities and we wonder, what are we going to spend our fortunes on? And this passage today, taken from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, addresses this topic. And this Sunday, Compassion Sunday, is a great day for us to consider how we will use the money that God has entrusted to us, how we will steward that money well. Because Paul speaks of this in today's passage. In verse 1, he speaks of the grace, the gift that has been given to the Macedonian church. And you might think, well, what gift have they received? Maybe they've received some money. But no, no, this is a strange gift that the Macedonian church has received. They have received, well, the gift that keeps on giving. What do I mean by that? They've received an ironic gift. The gift they have received is the spirit of generosity. So by grace, God has put it on their heart to be people who give and love to give. Paul is writing from the north of Greece, or Macedonia, um, a less wealthy area, to the south, to the church in Corinth, a much more wealthy area. And he describes to them what's going on in the churches in Macedonia. In verse 2, the severity of their trials and their, and I quote, extreme poverty. And despite this, uh, two things in verse 2 overflow. The first thing that overflows is their joy... And the second thing that overflows is their generosity. They lack security, they lack prosperity, but you know what they have in spades? Gospel-centred joy and generosity. So much so that in verse 4, they urgently plead, they beg with Paul to let them contribute. In effect, this is what the church says. Um, I don't know whether our wardens have ever had this experience of someone coming to them to say this. We're very sorry to bother you. We have very little and really so little that probably in the grand scheme of things if we give it to you and you take it to people on the other end it's probably not going to make a meaningful difference at that end and so it might not make a big difference to them but it would make a big difference to us if you would let us give what we have to be a blessing to others i'm sure our wards have not had that experience but that was the experience of the macedonian church that they begged. In fact, I'll read to you verse 4, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. They gave even beyond their ability to give, verse 5, as an expression of their commitment to whom? To God and to Paul. I note here, especially in light, I note this here because in light of the Corinthian church's tendency to associate themselves with Jesus but to distance themselves from Paul. To be committed to God is to be committed to his people. And so I want to take this opportunity to thank you for your commitment to church each Sunday. There are people here in this church building right now who are pretty new to this church. Thank you for being here. There are people here who are visiting from different places. Thank you for coming along. But I want to say thank you to you for your commitment to God and to his people because Christians are not called to a solitary life, but rather to live their lives in solidarity with other Christians. And these Macedonian churches understood that. And so they carried the burdens of others. Which others? Well, the Christians in Jerusalem, Jewish people there, Jewish Christians who are very poor. And you can read about that in your own time in Acts chapter 11, Romans chapter 15. But the Corinthian church knew about this because Paul had written to them back in the previous letter in 1 Corinthians 16. 
when the Macedonian churches that heard about the plight of the Christians in Jerusalem. It was a long way away, more than 2,500 kilometres by land from Macedonia or Corinth to Jerusalem. And that's a long way to really know what's going on on the ground. So they didn't know a lot, but they knew this, that there were Christians there who were in need. And that's all they needed to know. And so they gave generously. Now, St. Paul highlights their good example to encourage the Christians in Corinth. He says, Corinthian Christians, look at the Macedonian Christians. And he challenges and encourages them in verse 7. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love that we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Paul is being a bit cheeky here. If you read Paul's first letter to this church, you'd know that sometimes the Christians in Corinth reflected the broader culture of that city and they were a little too self-confident. I heard someone say this about husbands and wives once. You can decide for yourself. My guess is there's more than an element of truth in it. So a word to the wives in the congregation, try this. If you want your husband to do something, asking them sometimes works. But if you really want something done, say mowing the lawn, try something like this. Say to him, honey, I was driving down the street today and I saw some people's lawns looking scruffy and I thought, wow, I am so lucky to have a husband who is really good at gardening. And you watch our little chests puff out. I am very good at gardening, aren't I? In fact, you know what? I'm going to go do some mowing right now. Some would say that's because men are shallow and vain. Others would say that we thrive with encouragement. And if someone comes up to me after the service and says, Hayden, you are so good at preaching short sermons. (laughs) I am, aren't I? I'm going to preach shorter sermons from now on. (laughs) Paul commends the Christians on the very things they take pride in. But then he adds the importance of giving. You can almost imagine the Corinthian Christians saying, good at giving, aren't I? Here in this passage, Paul alludes to the famous teaching in 1 Corinthians 13, in which he says that faith, speech, and knowledge, all things that the Corinthian church prided themselves in, those things are worthless if they do not have anyone? Love. And so he encourages them that as they grow more in the love that Paul has shown to them, Love that is a reflection of God's love for them. As they grow in that love, then they are to live that love out. It's to find expression in the grace of giving. And so now we come to the test that Paul gives them. And this test doesn't entirely sit comfortably with us because why is Paul assessing their spiritual maturity? Why is he, it almost feels as though he is setting them up to fail. But he's not. Uh, You might be uh, familiar with uh, these lollies, gobstoppers. We used to call them jawbreakers. They're kind of rock solid and they're impossible to chew. You pop them in your mouth and several hours later, they slowly, slowly begin to dissolve. But as they dissolve, you can see that the surface layer, the surface colour has disappeared and deeper layers have emerged. And there are layers upon layers of questionable colours and thoroughly artificial flavours. Bear with me here as I explain this a little bit. In this passage, Paul speaks of testing the Christians in relation to their giving. He says in verse 8, I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Many people here feel as though Paul is pressuring or manipulating the Corinthian Christians into giving more. Almost as though he's saying, look how much the Macedonian Christians gave, how much are you going to give? But there are two ways in which we misunderstand this test. The first is to think that what matters most is how much money is given. That's the first mistake, to think that what matters most is how much money is given. But this is to focus on the outer layer and not the deeper, more significant layers below. Because the core of the matter concerns not the amount donated, but the desire to give. Verse 10. And here is my judgment, Paul says, about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but to have the desire to do so. 
And in the next two verses, Paul speaks twice of their desire or willingness to give. It is this desire, which, by the way, must be combined with discipline. In verse 11, Paul notes that the Corinthians have every intention to give, but it must be completed. Desire combined with discipline. That matters much more than the amount donated. For as Paul highlights in verse 12, we give according to what we have. The capacity to give varies from Christian to Christian and from circumstance to circumstance. But the desire to give generously ought to be consistent across every Christian person. The test is not the outer layer of the dollars and cents, but the deeper layer within, the desire to give. That is a heart that is transformed by the gospel. And the second mistake that some people make about this test is to think that this is an entrance exam for heaven. Oh, right, okay, I better start giving, otherwise I won't get to heaven. No, this is not an entrance exam for heaven. This is rather not so much about what we will do for God, but it's a test about whether we have truly understood what God has done for us. I'll say that again. This test is not about what we will do for God. It's a test of whether we have understood about what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. Verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. This is generosity. That the Prince of Heaven would, to draw inspiration from Philippians 2, so humble himself that he would be born as a human being, that he would be stripped of every dignity, stripped of every dollar, and ultimately be given over to death. He is the one who made all things and he became no thing, that is nothing, in order that we sinners, people who are spiritually impoverished, those who are in great need, might have something far more precious than money, that we would be known and loved and welcomed and named as sons and daughters in the family of God. The careful readers amongst you will note that in verse 5, the Macedonian Christians were described not as giving money, but as giving themselves. This is what Jesus has done. He has given us himself. In the song from our friends at City of Light, it says this, What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. It is the greatest gift that can be bestowed, that Christ would enter into poverty, that we might have the riches of forgiveness and friendship with God. And so if we begin to get this grace, then we will begin to get giving. And Tim Keller, reflecting on the care for the poor, shown by 18th century evangelist Jonathan Edwards, wrote, If you grasp substitutionary atonement, that is Christ dying for you, in both your head and your heart, you will be profoundly generous to the poor. All sinners, saved by grace, will look at the poor of this world and feel that in some way they are looking in the mirror. Here is a person in need. I am in great need as well. And all superiority will be gone. Those who give to the poor out of a desire to comply with the moral prescription will always do the minimum. If we give to the poor simply because God says so, the next question will be how much do we have to give? That question and attitude shows that this is not gospel-shaped giving. He concludes, we must help the poor, even when we think we can't afford it. Edwards calls the bluff and says, what you mean is you can't help them without sacrificing and bringing suffering on yourself. But that's how Jesus relieved you of your burdens. And that is how you must minister to others with their burdens. I wonder if you know about the work of the charity Sisters Inside. Up until 2020, until the law was changed, thank God, in Western Australia, a person who has no criminal convictions could be arrested and imprisoned until the fine was paid off. In that place, the people who were languishing in prisons were largely made up of Aboriginal mothers. They did not have the capacity to pay the fines, They were living in poverty. They were trying to provide food and shelter for their children and families. And so they were put in jail until they could pay off the fine. 
And so the Sisters Inside Charity set up a GoFundMe page so people could donate to pay the fines of other people in order that they might be released. More than $1.3 million was given by ordinary Australians and many, many women were released from jail. Consider what Debbie Kilroy, CEO of the charity, recounts as one of the responses of those who experienced, was a beneficiary of this grace of giving. She says this, I've spoken to Aboriginal mothers who've had their fines paid in full. I told them they can't be arrested. They cheered, screamed and cried. They're overwhelmed at donors' generosity. One even asked, what's the catch? To which I replied, there is no catch. You are free to go home. This is a beautiful expression of grace and generosity. But this is the experience of every Christian person. Because we had a debt that we could not pay. We were overwhelmed by poverty and powerlessness. And yet one, lo one person loved us. Showed generosity to us. And so we are free. And there is no catch. And when we begin to understand that we have been recipients of grace, our hearts are moved to be gracious to others. And so Christians are called to give with verse 13 and 14, the goal of equality. And yes, verse 13 and 14, there will be swings and roundabouts. Sometimes you'll have the capacity to give more, sometimes less. Sometimes you'll be the person giving, other times you'll be the person who'll be in deep need. And I pray that there'll be a Christian there who will give to you. But the goal is to share. And verse 15, Paul reminds his hearers of the, God's provision for his people in the desert in Exodus 16. And the goal is that no one would have too little, but that's only half of it. He says the goal is that no one would have too little, but also, did you pay attention to the second part? That no one would have too much. I know that many of you pray that God would provide your daily bread that God would give to you all that you need. Please keep praying that. But I wonder if you would consider adding a prayer. Not just that you would not have too little, but would you consider that praying that God would move in your heart to give to others so that you would not have more than you need? <laughs> that you would have enough? Would you pray that God would neither give you poverty nor riches to cite the book of Proverbs. That's a dangerous prayer, but it's a prayer that shows that we are beginning to understand grace. This morning, I commend to you the work of compassion because there are brothers and sisters who are in great need in the world. And according to your means, which will be different for every person, would you consider giving? Yes, give money. And also encouragement and prayer. But would you give of yourself in any way that you can, to support others, to support those children and families who are in need in the Philippines. And I wonder if you'd ask yourself a question. Not merely how much am I donating, though that's not unimportant, but that's focusing on the outer layer, isn't it? But to look more deeply into your heart and ask, do you want to give? Do you desire to be generous? And would you ask that God would grow in you, in us, the grace of giving? Let me close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, who so graciously provides for all our needs, grant us neither poverty nor riches, but give us only our daily bread. Otherwise we may have too much and grow proud, or too little and become fearful. Teach us to see our spiritual poverty and need and to come to Christ Jesus with open hands. For through him who became poor for our sakes, we are rich beyond measure. By your Holy Spirit, grant to us the grace of giving, that being grateful for the things that we have, we may be moved to be generous to those who are in need. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thanks for listening. We trust today's message encouraged you as you follow Jesus. For more information about Emmanuel Church, please visit our website, glenhaven.church. Until next time, bye for now.